Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the Camden Public Library, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I'll be your reader today. Thank you very much for joining me. I think one of the greatest joys in my own life and our socialized human beings that we are has always been meeting people who have a passion for something doesn't necessarily have to be a passion for the world or saving the world or environmental issues, the huge issues that we face, but a passion for something. Um, and I have been fortunate actually in my life to meet many people who um, have a passion for something. And it can even be just a hobby or um, collecting antique cars, <laughs> just something that someone gets really passionate about. That's only one in maybe 50 or 100 people, I think, in my experience. <laughs> uh, but I want to introduce you today to a very passionate man. Uh, and I think you'll enjoy his story and the stories he tells. I'd like to introduce Peter Matheson. Peter Matheson uh, was born in 1927 and unfortunately passed away in 2014. But he was an American novelist, uh, a naturalist, uh, a wilderness writer, and a Zen teacher, all rolled into one. I found him so inspiring when I read the first book I ever read of his, uh, which was The Snow Leopard. Some of you will know that book uh, from 1979, and uh, passion flows on every page. As a matter of fact, Matheson is the only writer to have won the National Book Award in both nonfiction for The Snow Leopard in 1979 in the contemporary thought category, and for fiction in Shadow Country, 2008. This was a one volume, 890 page revision of his three novels set in frontier Florida. An amazing book, a huge book. And again, an inspirational book. He was very much a prominent environmental activist in his own way through his literary work. His nonfiction um, featured mostly nature and travel, notably American Indian issues and histories, such as a detailed and controversial study of the Leonard Peltier case in the book, In the Spirit of Crazy Horse, 1983. And it is because of that focused theme and interest that Mr. Matheson writes so beautifully about is our salute and our honor to Indigenous Peoples Day, which is of course next Monday, October 11th. So this is why I've chosen this book today. I do wanna tell you a little bit about the snow leopard before we go into today's book, which is called Indian Country. But the snow leopard, I want you to read that one as well. It is an unforgettable spiritual journey uh, through the remote Himalayan mountains of Nepal to study the uh, Himalayan blue sheep. That's very particular. <laughs> and possibly glimpse during that uh, journey, the rare and beautiful snow leopard. But more than that, it is a book steeped in nature with incredibly beautiful descriptions of the Himalayan people and the wildlife, especially birds, interestingly enough, in that book. In the glory of sunrise, this is a quote from the book, in the glory of sunrise, spider webs glitter and green finches in October gold bound from pine to shining pine. Pony bells and joyous whistling, young children jump as if come to life. He's very, very poetic in his books. Uh, 
the book is not only an inspiring dance with nature, so to speak, but it really is a true pilgrimage. It, it's a journey of the heart. Uh, and uh, when I read it, I was quite bowled over. Two of Matheson's stories of fiction were actually adapted for film. Uh, the early story, Travel and Man, uh, was made into a film called The Young One in 1960. A bit hard to find, I discovered. Uh, it was directed by renowned Spanish uh, film director, Louis Brunel, um, and supposedly a great film, although I'm yet to find it. So if you happen to have it at home in your collection, uh, please uh, let me borrow it. <laughs> the other was a novel called A Play in the Fields of the Lord, uh, which Matheson wrote and was made into a film in 1965. Um, no, he wrote it in 1965. It was made into a film in 1991 uh, of the same name, directed by the Argentine-Brazilian uh, filmmaker Hector Barbenco, with Tom Berenger, John Lithgow, Kathy Bates, and Aidan Quinn. It's a highly respected film, and I did find that, and I did manage to see it, so I can highly recommend that for sure. Um, let me tell you now about Indian Country, the book that we're going to read from today. Uh, the themes of vanishing wilderness, um, of a world in which humans are only an insignificant part, uh, and of the rape of the land are all a part of Matheson's book, Indian Country. He tackles a subject of the loss of Native American lands and traditions. Um, both are sad, uh, but traditions for me were even sadder. Uh, he passionately, passionately, sees the American Indians as the last representatives of a life tied to the land and in harmony with nature. Juxtaposed with that is American capitalism. Big business taking over more and more of the land and of course destroying more and more of the environment in its greed for materials and profit. Most victimized by this voracious habitat, Matheson feels, are the Native American tribes whose best interests have not been represented well by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA. So this is the inspiration for the book. The book is fascinating in that it covers nearly the entire country. Uh, it's not a huge book, but it is precise, concise, very factual, and very, and at the end of each chapter is the resolution, good or bad. Um, we start in Florida, actually, as I mentioned earlier, his book for the National Book Award was about Florida. We start in Florida and we, we uh, go through the Carolinas next. We end up uh, just sort of on the border of New England. I wish there were more of that. Um, and we end up in upstate New York, uh, very close to the Canadian border and over the border, actually. We end up going west through Illinois. And then from there on, we're in every state west of the Mississippi River. I counted in reading the book, I counted 15 different tribes. Uh, there, I may have missed some, but 15 different tribes, which surprised me. Uh, and these, uh, through history, some of them now, unfortunately, no one longer with us, extinct. What I'm going to do today, uh, we're not going to cover the entire country at 45 minutes, obviously, but I want to impress upon you the, um, the beauty of Matheson's observations and the beauty of his writing, in addition to the factual part of his writing. He is 
has his finger on the pulse. I used those words <laughs> uh, last week, but Matheson is right there. I'm going to start though with a quote from a Native American Indian chief from 1865. This quote actually begins the book. Uh, the chief's name is Self, as the word stealth without the T, Self, S-E-A-L-T-H. Uh, and this is a, a, a quote from him. How can you buy or sell the sky, the warmth of the land, the idea is strange to us. We do not own the freshness of the air or the sparkle of the water. How can you buy them from us? We know that the white man does not understand our way. One portion of the land is the same to him as the next, for he is a stranger who comes in the night and takes from the land whatever he needs. The earth is not his brother, but his enemy. And when he has conquered it, he moves on. He leaves his father's graves and his children's birthright is forgotten. There is no quiet place in the white man's cities. No place to hear the leaves of spring or the rustle of an insect's wings. But perhaps because I am a savage and do not understand, the clatter only seems to insult the ears. And what is there to life if a man cannot hear the lovely cry of a whippoorwill or the arguments of the frogs around a pond at night? The Indian prefers the soft sound of the wind darting over the face of the pond and the smell of the wind itself cleansed by a midday rain or scented with a pinion pine. The air is precious to the red man for all things share the same breath, the beasts, the trees, the man. The white man does not seem to notice the air he breathes. Like a man dying for many days, he is numb to the stench. When the last red man has vanished from the earth and the memory is only the shadow of a cloud moving across the prairie, these shores and forests will still hold the spirits of my people. For they love the earth as the newborn loves its mother's heartbeat. One thing we know, our God is the same. This earth is precious to him. Even the white man cannot be exempt from the common destiny. Quite beautifully written, 1865. Self was the chief of a Native American tribe, the Duwamesh, D-U-W-A-M-I-S-H. So let us begin with Mr. Matheson's words now. The first chapter is a stage setter, so to speak. <laughs> it doesn't bring us geographically around the country necessarily. It's sort of a broad brush introduction to the topic of the book. Um, it is called Native Earth, S speaks for itself very clearly. Uh, let's start there and then I hope to have the time to read from one of the chapters um, of local color, so to speak, introducing you to the people uh, and the pride uh, and the connection to the earth. I'll hope I'll be able to read Native Earth fast enough to get to that. So this is Native Earth by Mr. Matheson. Christopher Columbus going ashore in the Antilles 
was struck by the profound well-being of the island Arawak. Quote, there is not in the world a better nature. They love their neighbors as themselves and their discourse is ever sweet and gentle. End quote, Christopher Columbus. It has been suggested that he named them Indios, not because he imagined them to be inhabitants of India, which in the 15th century was still called Hindustan, but because he recognized that the friendly, generous Taino people lived in blessed harmony and with their surroundings. Una gente in Dios, a people in God. In Dios, Indian. Within a decade of Columbus's arrival, these people had been slaughtered and enslaved throughout the Caribbean region and are now extinct. Columbus's admiration of the native people was shared by many Europeans before and after from the 11th century Vikings who attacked the Skraelings, the Inuit, in Labrador to the Dutch, English, French, and Spanish colonists farther south. But the fate of the Indios was always the same. Despite the great kindness and assistance they received from the Algonquin-speaking peoples, from Plymouth, Massachusetts, to Manhattan, to Jamestown, despite the abundance of the land and waters that the native peoples were so glad to share, the Europeans were appalled by the might of nature in a huge land without the mark of man. And with the departure of their ships, they felt homeless, cast away. They had not been prepared for the fierce extremes of climate, and they were dismayed by the huge dark wall of virgin forest, the huge silence. Hiding unknown dangers from their view, it was perceived as oppressive and dangerous, even malevolent. As William Bradford wrote from the Plymouth Colony, quote, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness full of wild beasts and wild men? And what multitudes there might be of them, they knew not. End of quote. Yet Bradford recognized the wild men as a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation quoting Mr. Bradford, and also no doubt the expectation of those three seamen of Drake's expedition who left in Mexico, left behind in Mexico in 1568, made their way unharmed all the way across the continent to Cape Breton Island, where they found passage home. The Indians strove to live honorably and responsibly as well as generously, and perhaps it was the very goodness of a heathen people so civilized in all meaningful ways that was so disturbing to religious men who had to wrestle with the bestiality of their own natures. Since they intended to usurp the Indians' country, it must have soothed the puritanical conscience to dismiss these open-hearted folks as, quote, wolves endued with men's brains. Roger Williams quoted there, or hounds of hell in Cotton Mather's term, to be cleared from God's path as speedily as possible. Thus, Captain John Mason, who led the villainous attack on a sleeping Pequot village in 1634, exulted in, quote, burning them up in the fire of his wrath and dunging the ground with their flesh. It was the Lord's doing and marvelous in our eyes. End of quote. The Indians soon realized that their hospitality had been repaid in greed and treachery. 
and those Algonquins of Virginia described in 1584 by a Captain Barlow as, quote, most gentle, loving, faithful, void of all guile and treason, and such as live after the manner of the golden age, quote, were the same people who destroyed the Roanoke colony a few years later. The Spanish too lost friendship after friendship from the Florida Apalachee to the Pawnee on the Great Plains to the Huma who eventually closed down their overland trail from Mexico to California. Even the French who entertained romantic visions of the noble savage reflected in the work of the painter Rousseau and the romancier Chateaubriand and managed their affairs more skillfully, encouraging the Indian natives to war upon one another. We're much weakened in the Mississippi Valley by conflict with a powerful Natchez, an event that led inevitably to the relinquishment of the Louisiana Territory and the opening of the American West. And the, quote, Americans would inherit much of this animosity in addition to what they invited on their own. An Indian people described by Coronado's chronicler in 1541 as, quote, gentle, not cruel, faithful in friendship, became the fierce Apache bands that resisted the whites so bitterly in the Southwest. Having roused the hostility of the Indians, the Europeans had good reason to fear these, quote, demons of the forest, who could have easily hurled them back into the sea. To exterminate Indians by whatever means, the plague and alcohol served as well as war and slavery, would not only assuage their dread, but facilitate seizure of their territories. Lord Geoffrey Amherst in the French and Indian War offered the Indians pox infected blankets. Most of Canada's Indians would die of smallpox in 1780. And Benjamin Franklin praised the efficacy of rum in the systematic extirpation of, quote, these savages as their usefulness as allies came to an end. Because the white men were outnumbered, they were forced until the 19th century to deal with the Indians as sovereign nations. But increasingly, as the whites achieved dominion and the red men were lumped with other mammals in the new world natural histories, it was perceived that, quote, savages had no claim to lands that were going to waste as wilderness, as hunting grounds. Few bothered to notice that most of the tribes were agriculturalists, not hunter-gatherers, with a strong sense of home country, and that their right to stand upon this land, to be a part of it, was ancient and inalienable. Instead, the Indians' own sense of land and life was used against them. As they said themselves, the people belong to the Mother Earth, not the reverse. They were the Earth. So how could they own this Earth as property? How could they own the deer or water or air? Quote, this way of life views land as the most vital part of man's existence. It supports them, tells them where they live, and defines for them how they live. It provides a center of the universe for the group that lives on it. As such, the people who hold land in this way always have a home to go to. Their identity is secure. They live with it and do not abstract themselves from it. This is quoted from a book, We Talk, You Listen, in 1970. Even the powerful Cherokee and Creek 
the civilized nations that had welcomed the English in the Southwest, even the Oneida and Seneca of the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy, so feared and courted by George Washington, had been driven west or penned on reservations, together with the Shawnee, Winnebago, Potawatomi, and many other peoples from the region south of the Great Lakes. In a great disruption and displacement that caused wars among the Indians all the way west to the Great Plains. The Indian territory that had earlier described all that great land beyond the Appalachian, Appalachian frontier and later broad regions west of the Mississippi River was even more isolated, narrow and remote until finally all those stolen and lost lands were lands of myth without boundaries and without horizons. Quote, Indian country no longer meant much to the white man, although as meaningful and still immediate to the Indian as his own heart. As late as the early 19th century, Lewis and Clark, encountering Indians of many nations who were still unfamiliar with white men, were sheltered and aided all the way to the Pacific. Yet President Jefferson, who sent them west, had long since deferred in the Declaration of Independence to the, quote, merciless Indian savages. And a century later, there was still talk of exterminating the first Americans. The historian Francis Barkman described these formerly admired people as, quote, man, wolf, and devil all in one. He wrote of the homicidal fury of the Iroquois, whose Six Nations parliamentary system so admired in this country's constitution. Mark Twain dismissed the go shots, the Gozi Utes, Indian tribe of Western Utah, with disgust. And the naturalist Whitmer Stone in 1902 observed in passing that the Arctic fox was, quote, the equal, if not the superior of the Eskimo, at least in matters of forethought, cleverness, and morality, end quote. In the late 19th century, the slogan of the Savage Arms Company printed above a likeness of Sitting Bull, was, quote, savage rifles make bad Indians good, quote. A century later, in 1982, 1982, Americans were offered a jolly board game called Custer's Revenge, in which victory was achieved when a naked white man caught and ravished an Indian woman. In 1983, a group of Indians who were refused service at a country and Western nightclub in Albuquerque, New Mexico, reported a sign that read, no Indians allowed. After 400 years, the defeated and defenseless, quote, peoples of God, Indios, had been dehumanized and the national shame of it erodes our spirit to the present day. Seemingly, the fear and guilt that drove us to make enemies of the red man were reflected in frontier attitudes toward that, quote, hideous and desolate wilderness, quote, unquote, of the pilgrims. Daniel Boone, breaking the so-called wilderness trail across the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky, referred to, quote, the horror of this wilderness which was everywhere met with a frenzy of land clearing far beyond any practical need. In the 19th century, among intellectuals, an identity of God with nature was perceived, but the ideas made small impression on the frontier. 
to judge from the ruthless treatment of the wild men and the wasteful and destructive exploitation of the continent, the view of primordial nature as a wilderness to be tamed and dominated has persisted in North America to the present day. The American Indian, of course, has no such concept. The only wild place was the realm of spirits and of talking animals entered by shamans who sought power at the ancient source of the old ways. The wilderness was merely uninhabited, a place, quote, where we do not live. A father part of home, it was, quote, only unknown when one's communion with it had not yet been revealed. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Indians lack of interest in modifying nature, their ability to live happily at one with it, seemed to the beleaguered colonists the most outlandish thing about them. In 1796, an Indian told the governor of Pennsylvania, quote, we love quiet. When the winds are rustled by the wind, we fear not. For after all, the wind is the voice of the creator. Asked what it said, an old shaman of the Nersalik Inuit replied that the message was always the same. Have no fear of the universe. As far north as Baffin Island, where the summer tundra and the winter pack ice provide so bountifully for the Inuit, as far south as the cold, hard plain of Tierra del Fuego, where the few trees are twisted, twisted and flattened by the ceaseless winds, where landmarks were commemorated by the white men with such names as Famine Mountain, and Desolation Cove, the indigenous peoples understood the rightness of nature in which nothing is out of place. One astonished missionary heard at Ona, gazing out across the uttermost part of the earth, murmur rapturously, Yakharuen, my country. When forced to move, the owner could not tolerate the relocation from their native earth and died off within weeks. Like most Indian peoples of the Argentine, they are now extinct. The Northern Spruce Muskeg of James Bay, described by whites in recent years as, quote, barren, uninhabited, fit only for flooding, quote, unquote, is known to the Cree as Kistikani, the garden. In the huge dripping evergreens of the Pacific Northwest, washed by sea fogs, wind and cold, remorseless rain, a Dawamish chief said, every part of this earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy cove, every mist in the dark woods, Every clearing and humming insect is holy in the memory and experience of my people. An Indian friend in California once told me how much she hated the phrase wild Indian in the books of American history that she was given to read in school. We were never wild, she said. We were just natural. Traditional people still in harmony with the world around them do not isolate themselves from other living things, nor consider one creature superior to another. This was also true of Europeans before the discoveries of science made them observers, manipulators of the natural world, instead of unself-conscious participants. By seeking to dominate it, the white men set themselves in opposition to a vital healing force of which they were a part and thereby mislaid a whole dimension of existence. 
This is a quote. One thing we know which the white man may one day discover, our God is the same God. You may think now that you own him as you wish to own our land, but you cannot. He is the body of man. And his compassion is equal for the red man and the white. This earth is precious to him. And to harm the earth is to heap contempt on its creator. The whites too shall pass, perhaps sooner than other tribes. Continue to contaminate your bed, and you will one night suffocate in your own waste. When the buffalo are all slaughtered, the wild horses all tamed, the secret corners of the forest heavy with the scent of many men, and the view of the ripe hills blotted by talking wires. Where is the thicket? Gone. Where is the eagle? Gone. And what is it to say goodbye to the swift and the hunt, the end of living and the beginning of survival? In such utterances as these and many, many others, there is a clarity and a quiet beauty that is stunning. We can no longer pretend as we did for so long that Indians are a primitive people. No, they are a traditional people, that is a first or original people, a primal people, the inheritors of a profound and exquisite wisdom distilled by long ages on this earth. The Indian concept of earth and spirit has been patronizingly dismissed as simple hearted naturalism or animism, when in fact, it derives from a holistic vision known to all mystics and great teachers of the most venerated religions of the world. This universal and profound intuitive knowledge may have come to North America with the first people to arrive from Asia Although Indians say it was the other way around, that the assumption of white historians that a nomadic people made a one-way journey across the Bering Strait from Asia and down into America and never attempted to travel the other way <laughs> makes little sense. Today, most Indians believe that they originated on this continent. At the very least, there was travel in both directions. In recent years, this theory has been given support by a young anthropologist who, on the basis of stone tools and skull measurements, as well as pictographs and cave drawings, goes so far as to suggest that the Cro-Magnon, the first truly modern man, who came out of nowhere to displace the Neanderthals in Eurasia, perhaps 40,000 years ago, were a pre-Indian people from North America. According to the Hopi, runners were sent west across the Bering Strait as messengers and couriers, and information was exchanged between North America and Eurasia in very early times, long before European history had begun. The old way capitalized what the Lakota called Wungaje, our way of doing, is very consistent throughout the Indian nations, despite the great variety of cultures. The Indian cannot love the creator and desecrate the earth, for Indian existence is not separable from Indian religion, which is not separable from the natural world. It is not a matter of worshiping nature, as anthropologists suggest. To worship nature, one must stand apart from it and call it nature. 
or the human habitat or the environment. For the Indian, there is no separation. Man is an aspect of nature and nature itself is a manifestation of primordial religion. Even the word religion makes an unnecessary separation and there's no word for it in the Indian tongues. Nature is the quote, great mysterious, the quote, religion before religion. The profound intuitive apprehension of the true nature of existence attained by sages of all epochs everywhere on earth. The whole universe is sacred. Man is the whole universe. And the religious ceremony is life itself. The miraculous common acts of every day. Respect for nature is reverence for the creator. And it is also self-respecting since man and nature though not the same thing, are not different. Thus, a leader of the Coyote clan, the Thunder clan, may be referred to as the Thunder or the Coyote. The Kachina dancer does not represent the deity or spirit, he becomes that spirit. Plants and animals that must be used are thanked with ceremony, and rocks are not moved carelessly from their own places. Every morning, prayers are offered to the sun, earth, and the powers of the four directions, the water that brings life, and the creator. This earth reaches us, takes care of us, and nothing is wasted, even the common clay. Quote, when we make pottery, we are very careful and do not waste anything because we know where it comes from, end quote. And this love of earth, this respectful awareness of the world around, of its warnings and its affirmations, brings a joyous humility, a simplicity that spares the Indian the great restlessness and loneliness that the alienated white men have brought down upon themselves. That's a very interesting statement. A simplicity that spares the Indian, the great restlessness and loneliness that the alienated white men have brought down upon themselves. It's certainly food for thought. There was no such thing as emptiness in the world, a Lakota says. Even in the sky, there were no vacant places. Everywhere there was life, visible and invisible, and every object gave us a great interest to life. Even without human companionship, one was never alone. The world teemed with life and wisdom. There was no solitude for the Lakota. The Indian people had no, quote, horror of the wilderness, and they did not disrespect the deer killed or the plant harvested, the graves of the old ones, the land and life that also belong to future generations. Quote, think not forever of yourself, O chiefs, nor of your own generation, said Diganawida, who led in the formation of the Six Nations Confederacy. Quote, think of the continuing generations of our families. Think of grandchildren and those yet unborn whose faces are coming from beneath the ground. Consider this Peyuti song as rendered by the Akoma, Akoma poet, Simon Ortiz. Ortiz is talking about a sacred spring. Something from there, something down in there is talking to you. You could hear it if you listen. Listen. You can hear it. The stones in the earth rattling together, the stones down there moving around each other. When we pray, when we sing, 
when we talk with the stones rattling in the ground and the stones moving in the ground, that's the place Indians talk about. Oh, we may stay there for some days. You can hear it talking from far, from far, far away, inside, they're moving from far away. Come to us, come to us pretty soon. Getting closer, getting close. The power is getting close and the ground is hot and shaking. Something is doing that and the people know that. They have to keep talking, praying. That's the Indian way, singing. That's the Indian way. And pretty soon it's there. You know, it's all around, it's right there. And the people are right there. The people talking, telling the power to come to them. And pretty soon it will come, it will come. The moving power of the voice, the moving power of the earth, the moving power of the people. That's the place Indian people talk about. Nitayuki Iyasin, the Lakota says, all my relations, meaning all one's relations with everything on earth. Indian healing ceremonies are based on the idea of restoring those relations, including the balance of body and spirit. They're not different, that are, they are out of harmony with the world around. In the Western world today, few understand natural matters that are taken for granted by traditional peoples, and few among the Indians themselves know how to listen to the earth. For most present day Indians, the traditional people say, the world is a dead thing. Like the white man, they have no home. All this was foretold by sweet medicine. The great Cheyenne prophet who tried to warn his people, quote, they will keep pushing forward, going all the time. They will tear up the earth and at last you will do it with them. When you do, you will become crazy and forget all that I am teaching you. Further quote, the white man does not understand the Indian for the reason that he does, understand, does not understand America. He is too far removed from its formative processes. The roots of the tree of this life have not yet grasped the rock and soil. The white man is still troubled with primitive fears. He still has in his consciousness the perils of this frontier continent, some of its fastnesses not yet having yielded to his questing footsteps and inquiring eyes. He shudders still with the memory of the loss of his forefathers upon its scorching deserts and forbidding mountaintops. The man from Europe is still a foreigner and an alien. And he still hates the man who questioned his path across the continent. But in the Indian, the spirit of the land is still vested. It will be until other men are able to divine and meet its rhythm. Men must be born and reborn to belong. Their bodies must be formed of the dust of their forefathers' bones. And back to Mr. Matheson, most Indian nations have, or used to have, similar attitudes toward Earth. Yet to this day, we dismiss those attitudes as something archaic, picturesque, to be pushed aside by that lunatic insistent on progress, on growth, on gross national product that is destroying the land and air and water, the wild animals and plants, the countryside, 
small towns, small businesses, small farmers, not to speak of quality and craftsmanship, birdsong, silence, night, and the very soul of man. At the end of an old John Wayne movie called Hondo, the Apaches are defeated. And the actor says, quote, it's the end of the way of life, a good way. Now get those wagons moving. Those wagons of progress are still moving, riding roughshod over what is left of the beautiful American Canaan. Not only have we failed to learn from the Indians' good way of life, we are still in the process of destroying it through acculturation, relocation, the recurrent termination legislation, the theft and pollution of earth and air and water, and the disreputable leasing policies, policies and land claim settlements that dispossess the Indian people from their sacred earth. Elders and spiritual leaders in many places in the United States and Canada say that traditional religion, while no longer forbidden, is frowned upon and interfered with by many, if not most of the bureaucrats and the governmental agencies who are often of missionary background. And that disruption of sacred places, mountains, valleys, isolated rocks and springs, and even burial grounds is not the exception, but the rule. Even where there is nothing extra to be gained by the alliance of industry, federal agencies, and acculturated Indians that dominates the economy of most reservations, most often in not or not, the transgression of sacred ground is also an environmental transgression, which Indians who do not share our view of the environment as something apart from themselves perceive as the same thing one cannot love the creator and desecrate creation. Traditional peoples the world over have much to reach, a spiritually crippled race, which as lame deer said, sees quote, only with one eye. This half blindness has been the curse of Europeans as long as the Indians have known us but we've not always been accursed. At one point, we too were at one with the mysterium tremendum. And we must feel awe again if we are to return to a harmonious existence with our own habitat and survive. We must consider this life essence that is all about us, manifesting in each moment, the music and the stars, the color of the wind, the dead stillness between tides at de dead of night, the birds, trees, sea pearls, and manure, the moment by moment miracle of our existence. All is God, D.H. Lawrence said, describing the religion of the Taos Pueblo, the whole life effort of man is to get his life into direct contact with the elemental life of the cosmos. It isn't enough to admire Indian teachings, we need them. We belong to this earth, this does not belong to us. It cares for us and we must care for it. If our time on earth is to endure, we must love the people in the strong, unsentimental way of traditional peoples, not seeking to exploit, but to live in balance with the natural world. When modern man has regained his reverence for land and life, then the lost paradise, the golden age in the race memories of all peoples will come again and all men will be in Dios, people of God. Well, that is the first chapter of Mr. Matheson's book, which is clearly his very, very strong and passionate statements of where he stands on this age old issue. 
the Taos Pueblo was just mentioned. Um, I lived in New Mexico for many years and the Taos Pueblo is the oldest still existing Native American Pueblo in America of over a thousand years old, made of mud and straw and water. And it is three stories high in places. Um, it's an amazing thing to view and to think that it is so very old. I have a few minutes left and I'd like to read uh, just some things. Uh, Ms. Math Mr. Matheson, when he, he's on the road traveling with different friends or different Native Americans along the way, he's extremely different from what I just read to you in the sense that he, he is in tune with the people that he meets all over and with the land, with nature. Uh, and he's very conversational. He's very laid back. He's uh, uh, amusing in places. Uh, so I wanted to just read a small section in the remaining uh, eight minutes that we have, just to give you a feel for his writing, other than that introductory chapter, uh, which was so uh, fascinating with such food for thought, I felt. So this is a, a bit from uh, the Great Basin uh, in the West, the Western part of the United States, uh, Deep Creek Range. Uh, and the name of the uh, tribe that we're focusing on is the Gosi, G-O-S-I, Uta, U-T-E. But this is what he writes about that journey and Buster McCurdy. You'll find a very different style. At the Utah border, a road heads south along the west edge of the Great Salt Desert, a waste of white alkali flats and old dead lakes stretching away between, between far small archipelagos of dry mountains. At each turn off, the road diminishes, tending east and into the remote Ibapa Valley, where good water comes down from the steep ridges of the deep creek range into an ancient territory of the Gosiuta. Near the south end of the valley where the land is green and there is forest on the steep valley walls, a dirt lane turns off past a well-made garden, meandering uphill to a large farmhouse set about with weathered sheds built out of logs. The whole house has been rebuilt by, by Molly McCurdy, by for Molly McCurdy, by her brother who lives in a trailer on the property. It was Buster McCurdy we had come to see. Craig said he had enemies on this reservation. Not sure of the reception we might get, he told me to park the truck for a quick getaway. While I listened to the bells of the homecoming sheep and the, the howls of an Indian boy who was wandering here and there behind the farmhouse, Craig got out and talked for a long time in the cool spring twilight with a stocky, guarded man in guarded, not gartered, guarded man in khaki shirt and coveralls who came out to meet him. Eventually, they came over to the truck. Let me make sure I made this clear, which is the section before this, that the two gentlemen who have spoken are Native Americans. And of course, our writer uh, is not. So he stayed in the truck for starters here. Uh, so coming out to the truck because it was cold, we sat in the front seat as in a pew, gazing northward up the valley toward High Pilot Peak. This is Chief Buster McCurdy, Craig said after a while. Chief Buster McCurdy exclaimed, still a little bewildered by our visit. Like most of the people we who had gone to, he had not seen Craig since 1969. And if not sure what we might want, he sat motionless and quiet for a while, thick, heavy hands square on his knees, a surprised expression on his face. The white stubble and soft, dark eyes are the inheritance of Basque shepherds in his ancestry. Uta is the real name of his people, their own name, that is for the Indians, the people. And Uta or Utah, he explained, just means them Indians over there. Gosi Uta or Goshuta, that's dusty Uta. 
he said, because we're going along covered with desert dust on the way to the meeting grounds over in Provo Valley, where we wintered sometimes with Paiute, Paiute, this is not the drug, this is the name of the tribe, and Shoshone. These days, a few hundred Goshi Utah were divided between this band and another across the mountains in Skull Valley. Wonderful hunting grounds, used to be, duck grounds too, and plenty to eat in winter, and we played all kinds of games. Uta and Paiute understood each other pretty good, but we don't understand much Shoshone language, just a, a few words to get by. The books say we're all the same bunch, but we ain't. Buster McCurdy was raised here in Ibapa, but he married a Utu woman from the high Utahs and lived over in the east part of the state for many years as a hard work working and very successful mechanic. In the late 50s and early 60s, his auto repair work had supported the journeys on Indian business made by his wife, Etta, and other traditional spokesmen. Buster himself won respect as a, a courageous and outspoken leader and was jailed more than once for his beliefs. Quote, among real Indians, Craig had told me, Buster McCurdy was a hero from coast to coast. I'm going to just jump around a bit because the end of the chapter is quite funny. Buster McCurdy laughed. Maybe I'll sign up with the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Get greedy too. Maybe I'll do prospecting. I had ideas for a fish hatchery here. and Maybe I'll go into cattle raising. We got good ground and good water. Aware of Craig's eyes, he said ironically, some days I'm an Indian and some days not. Tactfully, Craig spoke in abstract terms of the split among Indians that has come about due to the painful choice between Indian way and the white man's culture. And Buster McCurdy changed the subject by addressing a meadow lark that flew over. Cut out that crazy song now. That's not your song. He explained to us that in recent years, a number of birds had changed their song or stopped singing entirely, and that rattlesnakes hardly ever rattled anymore. I blame it on that stupid atomic energy, he said, referring to the wind of atomic pollution that had blown out of Nevada and contaminated people in St. George's, Utah. Recently, McCurdy had a dream that, quote, didn't feel like any dream, it was a vision. I saw Salt Lake City, all of them nice buildings. Smoke was coming out and some were ruined and there were no people, there was nobody around. The man with me said it must have been an earthquake, but I don't think so. It was something else. Before leaving, we filled our bottles with good mountain water and complimented Buster on how well the farm looked, the animals and gardens, and also his reconstruction of the house. He nodded. Molly boasts to everyone around here about her house, but she never said nothing to me about it yet, not even once. He laughed a little, standing there in the late morning sun. We had been talking for five hours, and even so, he seemed sorry to see us go. We offered a li him a lift back down the hillside to his farm, and he shook his head. Yeah, might as well walk, he said. I'll see you again, Craig said, taking his hand. Buster McCurdy held Craig's hand for a long time, looking him over. I don't know when, he said at last. And looking back at the still figure on the mountainside as the truck rolled down the slope in the spring ruts, I remembered a moment the afternoon before when Craig had asked him how many people here at Ibapa were still standing on their land. Chief Buster McCurdy, saying nothing, had raised up a single finger. Peter Matheson. I admire you greatly. 
I think the book is uh, is a treasure. And I hope by reading that small section at the end, you got more of an idea of his incredible um, connection to both the people and the land. He, he has it, he's got it. We like to think and hear where we live. We like hiking and we like Mount Batty and we like the seaside. We're more in touch with nature than so many other parts of the world. Uh, but then we get to vote on things that might change some of our environment. So anyway, Peter Matheson, Indian country as a salute to Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday next, uh, October 11th. Um, and do also, when you finish reading Indian country, go definitely to his award-winning book of the Snow Leopard. Well, let me tell you a little bit about where we're going next week. This is rather a, a geography journey is my program. We're going to my favorite part of the world and that is Provence in the south of France. I haven't been there uh, to my little house there in over a year and a half. You know why, of course, uh, and it's still precarious trying to make my way there. But anyway, Provence, the book is called A Garden Wall in Provence. It's written by Carrie Jane Knowles. Let me just read a couple of lines enough to hopefully entice you into this book. A garden wall in Provence, that alone sounds great, is an utterly charming novella about mothers and daughters being neighborly and the power and importance of fresh bread. <laughs> a chaotic week of mishaps and misunderstandings in Avignon, France, in this lighthearted story of family and love. Madame Renault reigns at the helm of her neighborhood. Her daughter Monique, who years ago was married by the violent, was maimed by the violent Mistral wind, is determined to break free from her mother's tender yet stifling care. But Madame Renaud is quite oblivious to her daughter's plan. She is preoccupied with planning Monique's birthday celebration. When Madame Renault is tricked into inviting every one of her elderly friends to come to the house on Sunday for the surprise party, she learns that Monique has a surprise of her own. There are three more lines. I shan't read them. I don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> so please join me next week for A Garden Wall in Provence. Mentions the wonderful walled city of Avignon. You may know the song Sur le Pont d'Avignon, the bridge in Avignon that only crosses half of the Rhone River, uh, destroyed in the war. Anyway, I live not far from there, actually, in South France, farther south on the water in Cassis, uh, C-A-S-S-I-S, -S -S, which is just east of Marseille. We like to say it's the first civilized city east of Marseille but it's a wonderful small town that you can't quite see from the train station at the top of the hill. So people frequently look, don't really see us and go on to Toulon. <laughs> it makes the locals happy, but not the shopkeepers. Anyway, that's a little sideline. <laughs> Next week, a garden wall in Provence uh, taking place in a beautiful, beautiful Avignon. I hope you'll join me. Uh, we also have a dedicated uh, email address if you'd like to comment on today's reading or any other past readings or make a suggestion for a book. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, that address is friday-explorations with an S at usa.net, friday-explorations at usa.net. So please uh, send us an email. And a final salute to Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, October 11th. Thank you very much for joining me and Peter Matheson today with a story from Indian country. See you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>